Good morning. Palm Sunday. Today, we, uh, we remember the triumphal entry when Jesus is on a donkey on his way into Jerusalem on his last week before the crucifixion. And most sermons this week are going to be about that triumphal entry. And honestly, I was tempted to do the same thing. But as I read this story, I was struck by a couple of things. One of the, th this is actually one of the things that happens in every one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about the triumphal entry. John makes a note, though, at the end, afterwards. It says, though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe him. And I'm struck by that. Because even though they were saying, Hosanna, 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 glory to the king, the son of David, they still didn't believe him. They were acting out of praise that they hadn't internalized at all. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this time that you've given us to study your word, to learn at the feet of the greatest teacher ever, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, be with me. Let what I say be only what you say. And let my words carry your wisdom. And it's in the name of our precious Savior, I pray. Jesus Christ, amen. You see, in the story of the Passion, we have the King. We have Jesus, the once and always ruler of the universe, entering Jerusalem, the city of God. And they rightfully say, Hosanna, Hosanna, here comes the King. It would have been wrong for them to say anything else. But what we see here with the crowd in John 12, 37, where it says that though he had done many signs before him, they still did not believe him, is the failure in understanding and belief. You see, human understanding of that time was that Jesus was going to come and conquer the Romans. That Jesus was going to come and become the physical king of Israel. And later on, in that same passage, we see the Pharisees talking to each other and saying, hey, we haven't gotten very far with this man. Look how popular he is. They're putting palm branches in front of him and declaring him the king of Israel. We see the failure of human religion. They missed who he was because they were so married to their plan to their religion, to their understanding of what God could and couldn't do. And then a little bit later, when Jesus is in Gethsemane, he asks his disciples, wait for me as I pray. And we see a failure of human perseverance where the disciples fell asleep instead of waiting for him. And then, of course, we see Judas, a failure of human ambition, 
who, seeing that Jesus was not going to conquer Rome, decided to sell Christ. Then, on the morning before his crucifixion, we see the failure of human love in the face of Peter. I can imagine a young lady walking up to Peter and telling him, hey, weren't you with him? And Peter remembering all those times saying to Jesus, Jesus, the other disciples might fail you, but I'm not going to. Maybe these guys, maybe John, he's kind of young. He'll probably fail you. I won't. Young girl comes up to him. You sound like one of them. Aren't you with him? No. No, I'm not. He goes so far as to curse when he says that he's not with that man being Christ. Then we see the failure of human government in the face of Pilate. Pilate was not a righteous ruler. The Bible tells us that the government, the rulers, are set up by God and given responsibilities to enforce God's will, and Pilate was not a just ruler. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. He says so himself to the Pharisees, I find nothing wrong with this guy. But because of the pressure of a minority of the people there, and quite possibly members of the same crowd that were with him as he entered the city, he was pushed to convicting him into crucifixion. We see a failure in human government. And we see the failure in human desires in the crowd's preference for, Barnab for uh, Barabbas. I was going to say Barnabas. It's a different guy. You see, instead of choosing the king, they chose another sinner like them. Human desire is to make God more like us. We'd rather want a criminal like us, someone who's not God. So in these stories, we've seen the failure of human understanding, the failure of human religion, the failure of human perseverance, the failure of human ambition, the failure of human love, the failure of human government, and the failure of human desire. The entire passion story is a disaster. We are a failure in this story. We as humans had the king. This Palm Sunday, the week before, they were excited. This is the king, but he didn't fit their plan. And so they rejected him. Because even though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. And so today we're going to go to the passage that we're going to be working through. And it's going to be uh, in a book that a lot of people don't like preaching from. It's in the book of Revelation. Revelation 5. Now, just a side note, it's the teacher in me. It's Revelation, not Revelations. There's no S at the end of it. Um, it's one revelation, the revelation of Christ. Revelation 5, and we start from the beginning. 
And it says, then I saw in the right hand of him who sat in the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. This scroll is God's plan for humanity, the plan of salvation, his ultimate will, and no one was worthy. We failed and failed and failed and failed and failed, and no one in heaven or on earth or beneath the earth, in other words, neither the divine beings nor the humans that were alive or are alive, nor the ones who had passed in the past, because we, we like to say that the past was better than it is today, which is a lie, by the way. No one was worthy to enact God's will. And as we saw earlier, we had failed on every opportunity that we were given. And so John, the writer of the book of Revelation, is weeping. And when we look at the world, we see suffering. We see the evil succeeding. We see injustice everywhere. People who do nothing but evil continue to get away with everything. And those who manipulate others and use others continue to succeed and grow and become more powerful. It's no wonder that John was weeping. I'm sure sometimes we find ourselves weeping there. If only there was one of us that could change that. None of us are good enough to fix the problems of this world, to realign the world to God, to make anything good. But, what does it say right after that? It says, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. When no one was worthy, Christ was. When everyone failed, Christ triumphed. Then I saw a lamb, and here we want to be very specific. He wasn't actually looking at a lamb. He was looking at Christ, who he identifies as the lamb. Looking as though it, it had been slain. In other words, the crucified Christ. Standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Horns are a sign of authority, and eyes are a sign of wisdom. Seven being the sign of completion. He has all authority and knows all things. He is completely aware, and he is completely powerful. He is the culmination of power and wisdom. And he is the lamb that was slain. Now notice before, 
that the elder didn't say he was a lamb. He said he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David, which is the king. And the lamb who had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to the earth, he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And we had, when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. These prayers are those prayers that you have when you see the world. Where is the justice, God? Where is love? Where is your mercy, God? God holds them as though it were incense. They fill his tabernacle, his throne room. He is well aware of the disaster we have down here. And here is the new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. You are worthy, why? Because you were slain. Because you were obedient unto death. You see, a lot of times we think about Jesus in purely human form. We think about Jesus being our friend. And actually, we had a Bible study about how that works. By, by the way, I am advertising the Bible studies again at 9.30 on Sundays. Feel free to join us. We think of him as loving, caring, and mild. But he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the one who has all the power and wisdom of the universe. He is not merely a man. He is God incarnate. And though he was God, he lays down his life for us, the failures. And we continue failing. If anybody can raise their hand and tell me that you've had a perfect day, where you've been perfect and been perfectly good at loving God and perfectly good at loving your neighbor as yourself, feel free to raise your hand. I know it's not true. As a matter of fact, the story of the Good Samaritan should show us that none of us love our neighbor as ourselves. That we fail completely. But there is one, and that is our hope. That is Christ. That is the one who we rely on, the one that is worthy. Because he was slain. And he wasn't slain just because, or because there was a political issue, or because the Pharisees didn't like him, or because of some botched vote that voted uh, Barabbas free and him crucified. Nope. He was crucified and slain to save us. And while the whole world moved against him, and we failed again and again and again, his plan was set. And no amount of our obstruction could stop him. And no amount of our thinking we had derailed him even moved him a bit. 
for what Satan and his group, his demons, his entourage thought was their ultimate victory was in fact their ultimate defeat. Because only Christ was worthy to enact God's will here on earth. He is the one that's able to open the scroll. We aren't. We aren't able to do that. We weren't able. And in history past before Christ, we were constantly asking, who will save us? And we still have that tension of already, but not yet. He is already the king, but he is not yet the visible ruler of the world. Is he really the ruler of the world? Yes. He actually is the ruler of the world. Is he visibly ruler of the world? No. Not yet. For now, it is our job to, what does it say there? Reign on the earth. It is our job to be priests to God. In other words, to bring people to him and to rule and reign in his place until he comes. We are his stewards is one of the words that is used. He died not only to forgive us of our sins, but to put us in motion as part of God's ultimate plan. So it's not simply, I am saved and I'm sitting in the pew. It's, I'm living a life worthy of the calling. I am a priest of God. I am here to represent God and his plan. Now, in the same way that an ambassador can go to another country and represent that country, it doesn't guarantee that that ambassador will be treated well. As a matter of fact, Jesus makes the point that if they hated him, they're going to hate us. As a matter of fact, if they don't hate you, you should be very worried. Because you are the antithesis to this world. You are the right angle of turn. You are the complete turning of direction in their, in their presence. What does John say? John says, the light came into the world, but the world preferred the light. They loved the light, the darkness, I'm sorry. They did not prefer the light. They loved the darkness. And if we are in the light, as I have uh, preached last week, that we are walking in the light, expect a negative reaction from the darkness. Expect it. Do not be surprised, as Peter puts it, when you find all these tribulations. But remember that there is one who was worthy. And he is our king. One who did not fail in any test. And while we will fail and may fail here on earth, he didn't. And he is the guarantor of our salvation, not us. And though he put us into motion, it is not the motion that saves us. As I've said before, and the Bible says itself, it's not that we were saved because of what we did. We, uh, we do what we do because we were saved. Right? The Bible says that you were saved unto good works to do the kingdom's work. So that when we sing, holy, 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 or alleluia, we are not being hypocrites. 
We're not like that crowd on Palm Sunday that had other plans for Jesus. But we are submitted to him. I want you to look at that scroll. What does it say? It was written on the inside and on the outside. That speaks to two different things. It speaks to the fact that it's complete. There's no room for anything extra. And that it's in detail. God knows exactly and precisely what he will do and why he does it. Here's the other part. There's no room for your plan. There's no room for our plan. And while that crowd that was there outside of Jerusalem saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, praise be to the king that comes in the name of the Lord, they had a different plan. They were going to make him king there. And that wasn't the plan. They thought that their worst problem that they were facing was that the Romans were in charge. How many times does something similar to that happen to us when we say so-and-so is at the White House, that is our biggest problem? Or so-and-so is my boss, that's my biggest problem. You don't know the person I'm married to, Steve. That's my problem. No, it's not. Your biggest problem is your sin. Is the fact that before God, you are a sinner. That before God, there is nothing you can do to earn his grace. That's your problem. And that's the problem that you should be facing every day. That is the problem that Jesus came to address. And the problem that he is being here glorified for fixing. Look at it again. You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons of every tribe and language and people and nation. He purchased us or he redeemed us is another word that is used here for God. He has taken us from being dead in our sins and brought us to life. See, the problem with the world is not that so-and-so is in charge or that they ascribe to whatever philosophy that you don't like. It's that they're dead. That's the problem. They're dead. But we believe in a God that gives life. Not only that, but that gives life in abundance. If we keep reading, it says, that I looked and I heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Worthy is the Lamb. In contrast to us, there is no contrast. There is nothing that we can do to even remotely compare to our blessed Lord. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them. Hold on. You know you're in this, this sentence, right? You're, you're here. It says, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. 
Listen, where it says there, every creature from heaven and on earth and under the earth, it says this. Even those in hell. Even those who are condemned because of their sin say to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. You see, you will honor God now or later. When it says every creature, past, present, future, dead, alive, every creature will worship him. That is Jesus. That is Jesus. Not somebody who is just nice to you and see, speaks softly to you and says nice things to you when you need encouragement. No. We're talking about the ruler of all creation who willingly or unwillingly you will bow to. And that is our hope. He is our hope. He is our strength. It is Christ. Proverbs says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And a lot of times some commentators will try to soften that word fear. And they say, well, it has to do with respect. And yeah, respect is definitely a tone of it. And while I might respect a lion and keep him away and stay away from him, respecting his space, fear is definitely in the picture. I also don't want that lion to maul me. Yes, we respect God. But many times we miss understanding his power, his majesty, and his glory. And we don't realize that he is ultimately God, even without us. Even had he not decided to save us, or care for us, or love us, we would owe him all worship and all praise. Yet, he does love us. He does care for us. So that lion of the tribe of Judah not only can maul you, but he cares for you. He can destroy you, but he does love you. He does. Let us not miss in the story of Jesus, the fact that he is the once and future king of the universe, who will rule the nations with a rod of iron and tear them to pieces. I didn't just make that up. Psalm 2. Verse 7, I'm sorry, verse 8. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. This is God the Father talking to God the Son. And the ends of the earth your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like the potter's vessel. Now therefore, kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, 
for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. That is our king. That is who we serve. That is our salvation. He is our protector. When we see the world as it is, evil as it is, remember. Even if it's not in this life, justice will be served. Whether they feel the wrath of God now or later, the evil will be punished. The evil will be rectified. Christ will judge the nations. And so we say, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one that comes in the name of of the Lord. He is our King and our hope. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time that you've given us to speak of you, to meditate on you. Great, powerful, majestic.